Uh, so welcome uh, to planning for pollinators. Um, there's a lot of information that we have to go over here. Uh, for those of you who might be joining us again, who might have heard this before, uh, there's there's a little bit of new information this year that I've put into this. And what I really wanted to do was address the question that I get a lot from people who want to know how they can get more pollinators to visit their, their yard. And it's really not all that difficult. Uh, there are some uh, real tricks that you can use to, to make that happen. And none of, nothing is really cosmic uh, about it. Uh, it's just knowing the right things to do. Uh, as we start talking about pollinators, we need to understand the, um, you know, most pollinators, most but not all pollinators are insects. And when we start talking about insects, um, we need to realize that insects are, are having a really rough time of it these days. Insect abundance has decreased about 45% globally since 1974. Um, monarchs on, uh, on the west coast of the United States, the, the latest numbers from the season, their population has plummeted almost to the point that it's not gonna be sustainable anymore and it may go extinct on the west coast of the United States. Um, beyond that, there's just people who are act, act carelessly. Um, there's, um, there was a story out of Texas about uh, some people who went out to, a, to an apiary, to a bee yard, and decided to knock over the uh, knock over the hives during the night to set some afire, to throw some of the frames into a lake. And what I'd like to show you there uh, in the bottom image is that frame of bees, uh, they're floating on the water. Uh, that frame is loaded with honeycomb, and that honeycomb has, is loaded there uh, specifically with larvae and baby bees, essentially. Those nurse bees are on that honeycomb. They're not abandoning their, their larvae. They're still trying to tend to them, even though the hive's been ripped apart and, uh, and they're floating in the middle of the water. There's no way those larvae are going to, we're gonna survive that encounter. They were all gonna die, but that didn't keep the nurse bees from still trying to uh, tend to them all the way down until the bitter end. Uh, it, it's really tragic when we see things like that and, and see the uh, wanton disregard sometimes that people have for nature even, uh, that they see around them, even, uh, especially when it's really valuable nature uh, that's all around them. Um, then you can see uh, this is a uh, this is an example from last year uh, here in York County, a beekeeper uh, who had three hives on his property. Uh, they're about 300 yard, you know, 250 yards from the um, from the property line, which is if you're looking at the main photo on the right, property line is behind the tree line that's at the very far center of the uh, property, about 250 uh, yards back there. The um, the neighbor had his yard sprayed by a uh, mosquito treatment service, uh, in and they decided to spray in high winds. Uh, the winds were out of the north, and it blew all of the chemicals over his property. What you see on the left there is a result in the hives. It killed all of the bees in his hives. He had an organic garden that you see there on the right. Uh, it dusted that garden and no more pollinators there in that garden during the springtime when the garden is normally full of, of uh, other pollinators, not just honeybees. It was uh, quite a shame and the, uh, the, um, there are no repercussions for that. The, uh, the, that just goes on on a regular basis, unfortunately. But in the midst of all of that, there are some, there are, it, there, there is some nuggets of good news out there, you know, with the shutdown and some of our national parks were shut down over the last uh, year, we started noticing a lot of wildlife just coming out in the national parks. You know, when we shut it down, when the people stopped interfering with the, with a uh, natural course of things, they started seeing a lot more bears and coyotes and bobcats coming out into Yosemite Valley. It's, itself and, and roaming around there. Not that there were a lot more there, but they've started retaking those areas that they didn't go out in because the humans weren't there. People are starting to recognize the, the, um, the importance, especially during the pandemic of being able to be outside and in nature and get getting away from everything. Um, there's also some anecdotal evidence that in the last, uh, that two years ago, we saw a bump up in the number of 
Eastern monarch butterflies that we saw in the eastern part of the country, although that uh, that has plateaued and it doesn't look like that is a trend right now, but we'll have to stand by on that and see a little bit more. But one of my favorite stories is the uh, silver digger bee, uh, bees and um, the Presidio is a bit of land that used to be an army post out in uh, in San Francisco in California uh, that was closed in the 90s and converted over to a national park area and and, and uh, federal property, not in the Department of Defense. And uh, they started turning it into a national historic site and naturalizing some of the areas that had been manicured and had been uh, closely taken care of. So they started letting uh, some of the uh, the sand dunes that were on part of the property renaturalized with native plants. And uh, as a naturalist was walking along the beach there a couple of years ago in, uh, in 2019, they noticed that there were some activity in the sand and they couldn't figure out what it was. So they went over in there and took a look and they saw a bee that shouldn't have been there, or maybe it should have been, but it was last seen in the area in the 1930s. Um, and it's a silver digger bee. And with the encroachment on the habitat in San Francisco, the silver digger bees had lost so much of their habitat that they stopped coming back there and, uh, and hadn't been seen in that part of the state in about um, 80 years. But with the restoration of the habitat, the silver digger bees noticed it and they had moved back in and were reestablishing their habitat there. So it does give us a little bit of hope that if we pay attention to having habitat and establishing habitat in our areas, we could see the same sort of thing around our properties and around uh, our houses. And that's really what I'd like to kind of talk about today. Um, and the habitat's really, really important. What you're looking here at here on your screen is an island called Barrow, Colorado Island. Uh, it's, um, it's in the middle of the Panama Canal in Panama and Barrow, Colorado Island used to be a mountaintop there uh, prior to it being flooded and the canal being built. But since, since that time, it's, it's now an island. And prior to in 1914, right before it became an island, a bunch of naturalists went in there to do a uh, to do a survey of the avian species, the bird species there in that area. And what they were able to count, they were able to count over 200 uh, bird species there during their survey. When they went back a couple of decades later, after the after the Panama Canal had been flooded and then and then used, they noticed a. Uh, a decrease of 65 of those species. That's roughly a third of the species from that area were not there anymore. Now, bird species are one of the more mobile species that, that we have. And in no place of Barrow, Colorado Island, is it more than a quarter of a mile to the closest landmass. In some places, it's less than 100 yards to the closest landmass. But even that fragmentation of the habitat caused a loss of a third of the species of the birds that were there on the island. Now that says nothing to do with the with the less mobile species that might be there, the mammals or or some of the amphibians or reptiles that were there on that, but just the bird species alone, just the species that's fairly mobile, a third reduction in that area, in the same area, uh, just because of, uh, of um, habitat fragmentation. And that happens a lot in the U.S. In the U.S., we 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 are in love with our roads. We're in love with our cars, and so we we pave a lot of things. Uh, we've got over four million linear miles of paved roads in the U.S., and that was almost 20 years ago. We we've got more now. Um, that uh, 43,000 uh, square miles of blacktop back in 2004. That's five and a half times the size of New Jersey. So that's just a phenomenal amount of area that is paved and impervious. And what, what, what does that mean and why is that important? When rain falls on those surfaces that are impervious uh, uh, to, to water, that water will run off and it will carry the oils and the, and the dirt and the, and the pollutants that are on that surface and it'll carry it off. And very often it will go straight into our watershed. 
uh, it won't soak into the ground where the water where the ground can act as a filter and filter out those particulate as that water makes its way down into the water table. It's not able to do that. And so it carries all of those pollutants and those nutrients and, and, uh, and whatever is on that roadway and it carries it into the watershed. And here in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, we saw in the last uh, decade of the last century, we saw 40% 40, 40 increase in impervious surface, surfaces, which has a direct result in the quality of the water in our watershed, which has a direct result on the fish that are able to survive in our watershed and in the other, and in the uh, ability of fishermen to go out and, and make a living uh, or the ability of us to go out and go swimming in the York River uh, because the water area, it, because the uh, watershed is simply less clean than it otherwise would be. And when I say impervious surfaces, I don't just mean paved surfaces. I mean, say, new buildings who have that, you know, most buildings do not have green rooftops. They have uh, rooftops that aren't going to absorb that water. So it's going to flow off and not be as absorbed as well as it would if that, uh, if that ground was still there and able to absorb that water. And it goes beyond just the impervious surfaces that we have around us in, in, when we start talking about habitat fragmentation. Uh, you start talking about things that probably all of us have around our houses, grass lawns. Um, we have about 40 million acres in the U.S. that are, have been converted to grass lawns. Uh, a lot on the East Coast, and you can see in the graphic over on the right hand side, you know, the amount uh, of the percent of the total land area covered by turf grasses. Why does this matter? Um, because that doesn't have any links into our food web in our ecosystem. It's functionally sterile. Nothing eats pretty much the grass or gets nutrients from the grass in your lawn. They might get nutrients from the weeds in your lawn, but they're not going to get it from the grass. So what is, why does that matter? Well, because you had this habitat that was there before you put the lawn in, that was able to support the ecosystem, that was able to support the insects and the animals that lived in that area and provide them food so that they could harvest that and they could live. When you have a grass lawn, nothing will eat it save for Japanese beetle grubs. And I, I'm not sure that any of us really want to encourage the growth of those in our area, but um, but nothing else will be able to eat it. So you are removing all of that area from a food web when you have a grass lawn. Now, I have a grass lawn. You know, I'm I'm not here saying that uh, if you have a grass lawn in your yard that you're a bad person. Uh, my kids get quite a bit of use out of my grass lawn, uh, kicking soccer balls and uh, running around and playing, and so do my dogs. But if that's the only thing I'm putting in my yard, I'm doing then I am removing my entire area of my property from the food web and I'm further fragmenting the, uh, the nature that exists out there and making it more, um, more difficult for animals and for other things to live around me that I want to have living around me. But, you know, so, so let's, let's think about it. When we build a development, what's one of the first things we that's done. The developer moves in and clear cuts everything off of there. Then they put up a building and they put in a lawn and they put in some ornamental plants, right? They put in things like crepe myrtles or they put in boxwood or they put in nandina or they, you know, all sorts of other, maybe they'll put in a really nice uh, Japanese maple, right? None of those plants that I just mentioned are native to our areas, which means that they don't support the life in our area. And what we're doing is we're taking away food sources from the animals and insects that used to live around here. And we're replacing it with things that can't be used as a food source at all. And so we don't end up having butterflies or birds or things that are visiting our properties very much. What we're doing is we're creating little tiny isolated islands of nature. And when I talk about ice islands of nature, think of that Barrow Colorado Island that I just talked about. That Col Barrow Colorado Island is slightly less than half of the acreage of Newport News Park. Okay. 
very small amount of lamp, but when we start fragmenting it up like that and cutting it up, we lose the biodiversity that exists that used to exist there because it they just simply can't uh, exist on that small of a parcel of land. And so we lose things that could be around us all the time. And it's going on right in our own backyard. This is this is development in York County that's going on. And they did exactly what I was talking about just a moment ago. They went in and they clear cut everything. This is, by the way, adjacent to Newport News Park. It used to be um, full of hardwood trees and a rich habitat. So they went in and they took out everything. And this is these are pictures that I took just in there. Uh, what it looks like. And when they planted it, what did they plant there? Oh, they planted boxwood and nandina and grass and uh, things that uh, won't get eaten by anything. So they're, um, so it, it'll have some curb appeal, they think. But what they've really done is remove the entire area out of the ecosystem, out of a functional use in the ecosystem and fragmented uh, the area around them. So what I'd like to talk to you about today a little bit is I'd like to go into a little bit of the basic biology on why some of the things that I'm going to suggest to you, why they work. And so we won't get heavily into it, but I would like to talk to you about that. This is not just about pretty flowers. This is about getting pollinators into your yard and keeping them in your yard so you can see them and so you can enjoy them and so you can be helping out with your efforts of what you plant in your yard. I want to talk about the roles of host plants, uh, nectars and pollen, nectar and pollen sources, and then step in a little bit to uh, some of the uh, some of the things that are going on and, and, and how you can be part of the solution. And, and it'll all be in the form of not, nothing here is going to be a difficult thing for you to do. And I'll give you all of the resources that you need to, to be successful with that. So let's first start talking about food chains. Um, and we all remember from really from elementary school when we first heard about it, that, you know, the, the grass exists out there, it gets eaten by the grasshopper. Well, we, we know that's not exactly true unless it's native grasses, which gets eaten by the bluebird, which might get eaten by the snake, then by the owl, then the owl dies. It, its body falls onto the ground. It's decomposed by fungus, which then provides rich nutrients for the grass to grow again, right? Uh, the problem is that this is an overly simplistic uh, way of seeing it because it's really not a chain like this. What, what a better metaphor for it is a web, right? There are lots of different nodes where one type of organism would interact with another. There's not just one thing that's going to eat the native grasses. And there's not just one thing that's going to eat the the uh, the red breasted nuthatch. It might be, you know, uh, uh, it might be a larger bird. It might be a cat or a bobcat that might eat that. So there are lots of different nodes there, and and that's really good when you think about it because if we have a web of life, uh, think of it like a net under a trapeze artist. If that trapeze artist is up there doing their work and they fall, they know that that net is gonna support them and catch them when they fall, right? That what that fall would be an adverse type event, maybe say akin to a hurricane moving through our area. Because if a hurricane moves our, through our area um, and negatively impacts our area, well, then our area can, uh, uh, the, having a web of life, our area can recover from that fairly easily, right? Because it's not just one thing that our, are, if it was a chain and it broke one link in that chain, then we'd be done. But if it's a web, then it can be more resilient. But when we start eliminating parts of that web because we take away their habitat or make it more difficult for them to be there, so we reduce the species diversity, it's like going along on that net underneath a trapeze artist and cutting out nodes, cutting out junctions. So if he took one out, well, that's not going to be such, such a big deal. But if you start taking out two or three or four, and especially if they're in critical areas, well, then that might be a real problem. And you might not want to be that trapeze artist that's up there trying to swing from, uh, from rope to rope over this area that doesn't have a net that's fully functional. Similarly, if we have a food web that we have reduced the amount of um, biodiversity because we've reduced the amount of habitat that they have, then that is not gonna be as resilient to uh, exterior events, whether it is a very hot year, whether it's 
extra hurricanes coming through or whether it's just uh, extra spraying of uh, insecticides around to, uh, to take care of that nasty mosquito problem that none of us want to live with, right? So any of those are stressors on the food web. How, how resilient that food web ha is has a lot to do with us and the choices that we make in, in going forward with that. Because you see, in those food webs, plant when we think about um, when we think about that food web, and I want to go back to this for a second here. When we go back to this food web, things in the food web, especially when you go from the first trophic level, which are plants, to the second trophic level, which quite frequently are insects. It's not a hundred percent of the time, but usually. Most of the things that harvest the energy and all of our energy on earth comes from the sun, right? The sun come, beats down on the earth. The plants capture that sunlight through a process called photosynthesis, where they convert that sunlight and that carbon dioxide and some water uh, into usable sugars and starches in the leaves through a process called photosynthesis, right? That stored energy that the plant that can use, that the plant can then use to grow or it can provide to other animals um, for them to be able to use that so they can grow, right? And that is called uh, taking the energy through the different trophic levels and as part of the food web, that's that's the use of the food web, right? But the primary, the, the, the primary consumers of the plant material are insects. And so when we start talking about that, insects tend to eat plants that uh, they ha share an evolutionary history with. Why is that important? Well, let's, let's talk about birds for a second. 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America rely exclusively on insects to feed to their young. You can have as many bird feeders up in your yard as you want. I have, I have plenty in my yard. Um, but when it comes time to uh, bringing up their young, their young cannot digest those nuts or those fruits that you put out in your bird feeder. They can, their, their guts can only digest soft bellied insects like caterpillars um, and, and other things like that. So those birds will only build their nest in an area where they have access to a lot of insects. How many is a lot? Well, this, one of the smallest uh, native birds that we have in our area is the Carolina chickadee. Carolina chickadee normally uh, is nesting around this time of year and normally lays a clutch of six eggs. Those eggs, when they hatch, those chicks uh, spend an average of about 17 days in their nest before they fledge out and go off on their own. During those 17 days that those six chicks are in the nest, the parent chickadees will bring them between six to 9,000 insects to feed to their, to their chicks. If those insects don't exist within about a 50 meter radius of that nesting location, they will not build a nest there. They'll go someplace else to build a nest. So what does that mean? Well, if you don't have those insects in your yard, you're also not going to have the songbirds in your yard. Why is that important? Well, the songbirds don't just eat the soft-bellied insects like uh, caterpillars. They also eat things like mosquitoes that we want to keep down in our yard. So you lose the songbirds, you have more mosquitoes in your yard. And when we start looking at those insects, you can generally break insects down into two categories, generalists versus specialists. Generalist insects can eat just about everything. That's about 10% of the insects out there. Most insects are specialist insects. And uh, uh, why do we call them specialists? Because they can only eat a couple types of plants. You see, plants all do photosynthesis the same way, but they all don't want to get eaten and want to be able to live. So what they do is they have secondary metabolic compounds in their, uh, in their leaves that help make them unpalatable or actually poisonous in some cases to most animals. So what some insects have done over the eons is they have built up the microbes in their gut to be able to digest the secondary metabolic compounds in the leaves of these plants. 
but not every plant is the same. In fact, most plants have different secondary metabolic compounds in their, in their leaves that, um, that offer them protection. So that means that a monarch butterfly can only eat milkweed because it's developed the gut biome to eat milkweed. Not, nothing else or very few other things can eat milkweed, but the monarch butterfly can. So, and a lot of uh, our insects around us are those kind of specialist insects. You have things like, you have lots of examples all around the world with 90% of the insects, and there are a lot of insects out there, with 90% of the insects in the world being specialists, there's a lot of uh, good examples of that. So let, let me give you a couple of examples. Um, English were great explorers, if we think back to our history, started about hmm, 500 years ago, no, a little over 400 years ago, really exploring the rest of the world. In some areas, they were going to Asia 500 years ago. Well, about 500 years ago, they brought back uh, three different types of conifers, uh, three different uh, genus of conifers to England to plant there because they collected all sorts of things and then they bring them back and they create these wonderful botanical gardens. So they brought the conifers, uh, Cuberaceae, uh, Pinaceae, and Taxaceae, uh, and they brought them back and they planted them in England and they brought them back from the Far East. Um, after 500 years, only about 50 of the 500 species of the insects that exist in Great Britain are feeding on those conifers as opposed to a similar level, 500 back in, uh, in Asia were able to uh, feed on those conifers just because the local insects there had not grown up with and um, and developed a common evolutionary bond with them. That's 500 years, gives you an idea there. Uh, if we talk about the eucalyptus in California, we brought that back um, when, uh, when, we, when the English started uh, colonizing um, Australia, they found the eucalyptus tree. They said, hey, we've got a, uh, we know a, a similar climate in California, we'll plant them there. So that's been about 200 years. Uh, it, the eucalyptus tree in Australia is host to 40, 48 insect species, but in California, it's only a host to one. Uh, Clematis is, uh, is a, uh, is a uh, flower that is native to Europe. In Europe, it supports 40 species of insects, but only one of them in New Zealand. So it works both ways. It's not just things from someplace else, you know, coming to Europe or coming to America. It also works the other way. The, the fact is that unless the insect shares a, a common um, evolutionary bond with it, meaning that it's they've kind of grown up together, um, then they can't eat it and they can't uh, derive any uh, benefits from it. Um, even for the generalist, insects. The generalist insects that feed on plants, they did a study on that and they determined that native plants can support four times the biomass of uh, generalist uh, insects than non-natives can. So it really does matter what you're planting in your yard and planting those exotics that you find that have a different leaf chemistry will have a very real impact on what you have in your yard as far as uh, both pollinators and songbirds and everything else, the wildlife that you have in your yard. So, but there's good news to us because of, of all of the different host plants that exist in the world, one of the best host plants just for the species Lepidoptera. So uh, Doug Tallamy, who's a, is an entomologist at the University of Delaware, he did a uh, study on the different types of host plants that different uh, um, insects in the genus Lepidoptera would use. And Lepidoptera is the genus uh, that includes moths and butterflies and you know caterpillars for them as well. And what they found was that of all of the different types of um, of trees that were, or of all of the different types of plants that were out there, trees supported the most number of Lepidoptera species that were out there. And in fact, the, uh, the genus Quercus, which is the oak tree, supports over 530 species of Lepidoptera 
caterpillars. So that means if you have oak trees in your yard, you're going to have a lot of caterpillars, which means that you're probably going to have a lot of songbirds in your yard, right? And it, it doesn't just stay with oak. There are a wide variety of different trees that give you significant um, ecological advantage. But the fact is that the oak tree is, or the genus Quercus, which includes all of the oak trees, um, is a, one of those keystone species because it supports so many different uh, species of Lepidoptera, along with other insects as well. This was just looking at Lepidoptera. So how does that work out? How, how can you figure out what works in your area? Well, the National Wildlife Foundation has a native plant finder that's online. You can set up an account and keep a list of the plants that you might want to find by just going to their website, nationalwildlifefederation.org, native plant finder, and you can uh, build your own list, take a look through there, see what types of plants are native to your yard so you can plant those. Because here's the deal, you don't have to turn your whole yard into only native plants and no non-native plants. I, you know, my yard doesn't have, my, my yard has non-native plants in it. You know, I like citrus trees, so I have, um, I have different types of citrus in my yard. I do have some Japanese maples because we like what a Japanese maple looks like. But when I make a choice for the type of plants that I have in my yard, my first choice is going to be something that's native. And I'm going to first start considering that because of the ecological importance of that. And when it comes time to replace a dead or dying plant or a plant that's not working for us anymore, I, my first choice is going native because it's not the presence of non-native plants in your yard is not going to keep your yard from uh, being able to host insects or pollinators or things like that. It's the absence of native plants, of any native plants or of some key native plants that will cause your yard to not be home to pollinators and other uh, beneficial wildlife that you would like to have in your yard. So it's including them. It's, and sometimes it takes a little bit of going out of your way but fortunately, we have resources like the Native Plant Finder to help you out with that. You know, when I uh, when I advertise this, I use this graphic on uh, Facebook uh, of a picture that I took in my yard. It's a monarch butterfly on um, walking verbena. Walking verbena is not a native plant, but it is a very prolific source of nectar for pollinators in the uh, in the summertime when there's not many uh, sources for nectar. Well. The reason why I have the monarch is not because I have that walking verbena there. The reason why I have that monarch in my yard is because I have milkweed in my yard, which is the picture on the right. And I have a lot of milkweed in my yard. Why? Because if I want to see monarchs, and I love seeing monarchs, I've got to have enough milkweed that when they move through and she lays her eggs, she's going to find, you know, they'll move through. If she finds the milkweed there, she is more likely to stick around in my yard to mate near my yard and then to lay her eggs on the milkweed, which are then going to uh, hatch and, and uh, develop into caterpillars who are then going to eat that milkweed and, uh, and complete the life cycle in my yard. If I don't have milkweed in the yard, I might see a monarch, but it's just going to be transitory as it's moving through. Having, the, having that milkweed there is the real magnet that brings those butterflies into my yard and makes me see them a lot. Similarly, uh, last uh, two years ago, around this time, I was out on the Yorktown battlefield. I love walking out there. And I was in the rear encampment areas out by Washington's headquarters. And I noticed all the beautiful zebra swallowtail butterflies that were out there. This is a picture of it in the middle here, tons of them. And, and it's really kind of nice seeing them there because I don't see them a lot around my house. Well, why are they there? Well, it's because of what you see on the right side of your screen here. The zebra swallowtail butterfly's host plant is the pawpaw tree. The pawpaw tree is a native understory tree that grows uh, throughout our area, including on the rear encampment areas of the Yorktown battlefield. It's got a pretty uh, red flower that you probably would miss uh, if you're just out there looking, but it blooms around this time of year, but they don't care about that flower. What they care about are the leaves on the, on the pawpaw tree. And 
So as a result of that, you will see lots of zebra swallowtail butterflies out on the Yorktown battlefield because there are a lot of pawpaw trees out there. It's just knowing having that host plant around means that you're going to see a lot of that butterfly around. So what have I done? I've gotten a bunch of pawpaw seeds and I've been germinating them and I'm growing um, a couple of pawpaw trees on my property because I'd like to see some zebra swallowtail butterflies around here. Now that's a little bit of a long-term prospect. I, it'll probably be about five or six years before those really grow up in, in enough size that they're going to be able to uh, support the zebra swallowtails, but that's okay. You know, I can plan ahead for that. So, you know, if you're starting to say, well, maybe planting a host plant does sound like something I could do, but what, what are the host plants and how could I know what that is? Here's a list. And there's, it's easy to find them. Uh, the, um, the Xerxes Society has a list uh, that I'll give you some lists at the end of this. Uh, if you went on to the Lewis Ginter uh, Botanical Garden, they have a very good list uh, that, they, that they share. Uh, but you can have all sorts of these. The thing that I like to um, recommend to people is grow some parsley. I mean, that's one of the easiest things that you can do because parsley or dill uh, is very closely related to, um, to golden alexander. And golden alexander is the host plant for the uh, eastern black swallowtail butterfly. And they're closely enough related that the eastern black swallowtail butterfly can use parsley as a as an alternative host plant the, the leaf chemistry is similar enough and so if you plant a bunch of parsley around your house like I do every year I get tons of black swallowtail butterflies around my house <coughs> because I have their host plant here otherwise I just see them moving through as they're as they're uh, canvassing the flowers around the area but if I want to see them regularly then I need to have the host plant in the yard I'll come back to this or I can show this to you a little bit later. So the, that's about the host plants. Um, but the host plants only take part of part of the uh, butterfly's life cycle, right? The butterfly's life cycle um, also includes the adult form, which is the butterfly itself. And so they, the adult form does need nectar and pollen. Uh, nectar provides the carbohydrates pollen provides a protein for the, for the butterfly uh, so that they can then, uh, they can then have the energy that they need. Um, so when I start looking at things that I can plant in my garden to help out the butterflies, I need to know when um, about a, a, a pretty important thing to most beekeepers around here is the nectar flow in our area. So Starting at about the end of March and running until the beginning of June, uh, we have a lot of trees that flower in our area, uh, tons of trees that flower around here. And they are the richest source of nectar uh, for pollinators of the entire year. Uh, most of the pollinators go crazy. There is, most beekeepers uh, build up the majority of their honey during this time of year, and it's not the beekeepers who do that, it's their honeybees that do that, but they uh, build up their massive surplus of honey during this time of year because there's so much available for the bees to go out there and harvest. Uh, so whether it is the cherry trees that are blooming, whether it's uh, fantastic trees like tulip poplars or other things like that, there's lots of nectar and pollen available. Well, if there's all of that available during this time of year, then me thinking about attracting pollinators, I'd be competing with that if I plant a lot of things that bloom during the spring. So I don't go terribly heavy on things that are gonna be uh, blooming in the spring in my yard. What I target is when the nectar sources dry up around here and that's in the summer and then into the fall because from the beginning of June all the way on until later in the year, there are relatively few uh, nectar sources for pollinators in our area. So if I want, so if I know that, you know, that there's not the resources out there for them, I'm going to start providing them the resources. I'm going to be providing them things primarily that bloom in the summer and the fall around here to address their needs. Because if I'm filling their needs, they're going to come to me. They're going to want to hang out in my yard. And so I've listed some of the, um, some of uh, my favorites here that are really good pollinator plants. Most of these are native, although not every single one of them but I don't have anything on here that is 
invasive. Uh, like Agastasia is one of the best plants I have for pollen deers. It is native to the Midwest. It is not strictly native to our area, but uh, the amount of nectar that it provides to pollinators is fantastic. Um, there are lots of others that are native if you want to uh, do that. Goldenrod is fantastic. It does not cause hay fever at all or allergies. That's its, that's its uh, relative ragweed, which looks similar, uh, but is not goldenrod. But goldenrod has heavier pollen, so it's not wind pollinated and has prolific amounts of nectar and that blooms in the fall. So if you want to plant something that's going to be really useful to pollinators right before they go into their diapause or into their dormant states, uh, you'll plant some goldenrod in your garden or nearby. So uh, you, you can really help uh, the pollinators out at that time. A uh, catnip is one of my favorite ones I like to uh, highlight on here. Catnip is fantastic. Not only does it provide a rich nectar source for the uh, for the bees starting in May and going through July. But mosquitoes hate the smell of catnip. They, they dislike it even more than citronella. So, um, so they tend to avoid it. So what do I do? I plant it all over the place. You know, I get all the pretty little white uh, flowers. The pollinators love it and the mosquitoes don't like it, which means that it's a winner for me. Um, let's see. Let's talk a little bit about pesticides and herbicides <clears throat> because those are a real, real problem and responsible for a large part of the decline of pollinators that we see around us all the time. Uh, neonicotinoids are something that comes up often when I'm talking to, to uh, people. Neonicotinoids were developed in the 1960s and it was a well-meaning attempt to try and take care of things like uh, like squash bugs and aphids, right? <clears throat> so what does a squash bug do? A squash bug goes uh, to the vascular tissue on a, uh, on a cucumber or on a squash, and it starts chewing on that to, to, to drink the sap that's in there and, and feed itself off of that. And in doing that, it usually kills the plant. Well, a bunch of scientists thought, what if we could provide a systemic insecticide that we just put on the seed of the plant, but it gets absorbed into the tissues of the plant. Uh, so it's not mass sprayed out there. We don't hit non-target po populations. We just, it's just going to affect the things that are feeding on that plant. And so they did that and they were able to do it. And neonicotinoids were and are very effective at that. It's a synthetic pesticide. It's, they coat the seed with it. It's absorbed into the, um, into the tissue of the plant and then squash bugs and other things that normally chew on uh, the plant get poisoned and they die and, and it's effective. The problem is that it is an systemic insecticide, which means that it doesn't just get absorbed into the vascular tissue along the stems, it's also present in the pollen and it's also present in the nectar. Now, it, while it's true that uh, a bee or a butterfly visiting that uh, will not get poisoned and die outright from that neonicotinoids. There is significant uh, scientific evidence that's shown that it shortens their lifespan and it makes it harder for them to uh, navigate. Uh, bees are able to navigate very well from their hive, fly up to three miles away from their hive and then come back using a combination of, uh, of uh, being in tune with the magnetic fields of the earth and the sun position. So it's really a fantastic navigation system that they, that they have down, but they're not able to do that very well after they've uh, consumed nectar and pollen that's laced with neonicotinoids. Uh, so it, while it won't kill them outright, it is going to negatively affect them. Um, I put Roundup and glyphosate on here. Uh, glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup um, simply because it some people are reaching for this when it comes time to weeding rather than, than reaching down and plucking out the weed. And it does make things a lot easier uh, for people. But uh, I normally ask people when we get together, um, how many people they knew when they were growing up who had gluten allergies? Or how many people did you know when you were growing up that had celiac disease? I didn't know anyone who had either one of those, but I know a lot of people these days who, who have both of those. 
Our use of glyphosate has quintupled in the last 20 years. Why? Because farmers, um, we have been able to genetically modify so uh, soybeans and corn and other crops so that um, we can plant them. And normally glyphosate will kill anything that you spray it on, but we've uh, bred them to be glyphosate resistant. So we could plant them, they could start coming up and farmers have problems with weeds with those crops, but now farmers can just spray the whole area with glyphosate. It'll kill the weeds, but not kill the crop. And, uh, and the argument is that glyphosate will just break down. Here's the problem, it doesn't completely break down and you can still test boxes of Cheerios off the shelf and find residues of glyphosate in them. And that we have shown in rats and also in meta studies on humans that there is a direct correlation between glyphosate intake and gluten intolerance in rats and in humans too. So that's really important when we start thinking about our health and there are likely implications, although we haven't yet proven it, on pollinators in our yards. But the biggest one, uh, bar none, that, that you need to be aware of is pyrethroids or permethrin, uh, which is uh, widely used in our area for the control of mosquitoes. And uh, if you contract with one of these services that wants to, uh, wants to fog or spray your yard for mosquitoes, their sales pitch will go something like this. Um, we use a natural uh, compound or one that is synthesized from a natural compound and it's derived from the chrysanthemum flower, which we all know is natural. And uh, we spray that out there because mosquitoes can't uh, fly very long distances. So they need to move from leaf to leaf and then rest for a little while. And so we fog all of the areas in your yard or spray all of the areas in your yard where they might stop and rest and they will get this contact uh, insecticide on them. It doesn't hang out in the air. It's only a contact one. They'll get it on them and then they'll die. And so it's not going to affect you or your kids or, or anything else. And we'll just spray it out there and it'll take care of the mosquitoes and then we'll come back. And they're right. It will affect the mosquitoes, but here's the problem. It will also, they've also found, the EPA has found, and it's on the label, that it's highly toxic to honeybees as well as beneficial insects. So it will kill the pollinator, or it will kill the mosquitoes, but it'll also kill the bees, native bees, honeybees, butterflies, fireflies, dragonflies, wasps that feed on mosquitoes. The birds that eat the insects that are coated with this will die from the neurotoxins in pyrethroids. And it will drive out of your yard all of those things. So it will not only get rid of the mosquitoes temporarily, but it will, um, it will kill off all of the predators. So that when the mosquitoes come back, and they will come back, there will be no natural predators there to keep the mosquitoes in check. So when you have your yard sprayed with this stuff, you are perversely paying a company to make your mosquito problem worse. And we all know that, uh, or people who study insects, entomologists tell us that the best way to control nuisance insects is to attack the larval stage of their life cycle, not the adult stage. And that is true for mosquitoes as well as, as, um, as, well as any other insect. So, and the other side of this is the pyrethroids, the mosquitoes are evolving and fairly quickly so that pyrethroids are less and less effective against mosquitoes and they're, they're slowly beating them. Except the other insects, the pollinators, the things that we want aren't adapting as quickly and they're still killed off very quickly by pyrethroids. It was pyrethroids, you remember that, uh, that spray that I sh uh, showed you with the dead bees on one of the first slides? It was pyrethroids sprayed by a commonly known company around here in Hampton Roads in York County that caused that kill off of the bees. Right? So I used to have my yard sprayed with pyrethroids before I knew better. Uh, and, but once I started learning about the detrimental effects of it, I stopped having that done. And so I would encourage you, you know, if you have your yard sprayed or have had it, had it sprayed in the past, I understand why you were doing that. There are better ways to achieve your goals than spraying that in your yard and you will end up being a lot healthier 
and your yard will be a lot healthier and less mosquitoes if you follow one of these other techniques. So I'd like to share with you some of those techniques. It's called integrated pest management. So anytime that you're dealing with nuisance insects, whether it's the squash bugs or whether it's mosquitoes, you want to try a layered approach of different things to try and affect that insect so it stops becoming a pest for you. And what that looks like for mosquitoes, especially because that tends to be the biggest issue here, is you need to think about targeting their larval stage of development. And if you're doing that, they have their larval stage of growth in water or right next to water, and it needs to be stagnant water and standing water. And it doesn't need to be very much. It can be the size of a, of a cup of, of, of water, a cap full of water, not even a cup, a little cap full of water. So get rid of the standing water in your backyard. Most of us don't have old tires in our backyard, but if you do, get rid of them, or at least make it so the water drains out of them. If you have saucers underneath your pots in your backyard, get rid of them. You don't need saucers under your pots in your backyard. You do it indoors, that's a different thing. Outdoors, you don't need them. And if you do have them and you're storing them out there, turn them over so they don't collect water. If you have pots in your backyard, turn them so they don't collect water. Even under some, some pots have a nice curved lip. So if you turn them over, they'll collect water in that lip. Put, position it so it won't do that. You know, get rid of the standing water in your, in your backyard because mosquitoes can't fly very far. So that means that if you get bit by a mosquito on your property, you very likely inadvertently bred it on your property or in your neighbor's property right next door. It didn't fly from down the street it came from right around your property. So figure out a way that you can keep it from breeding on your property and your problem goes away. You can use companion planting for your different plants so you don't have to reach for, um, reach for uh, insecticides. I used to have aphid problems on my roses. What did I do? I planted society garlic around my roses. Aphids can't stand the smell of garlic. Do I have any more aphids on my roses? No, because I have a companion plant right next to them and I don't have to use any chemicals. Oh, and by the way, I have the pretty flowers from the, from the, uh, from the society garlic and it acts like uh, shoes and socks for my roses because my roses look good up here, but not so nice down here. So I planted something that'll look nice down here that'll surround my roses and give a little bit of uh, high, uh, differentiation and height to my garden. And it turns out looking nice. You can also plant plants that uh, mosquitoes don't like the smell of, or aphids don't like the smell of. Insects are much more um, attuned to smells than most humans are. And so, um, you know, honeybees are, they communicate through pheromones and they're, they're not the only ones that communicate through pheromones. Well, mosquitoes and aphids don't tend to like the smell of fragrant herbs. So you plant fragrant herbs and it's not that that's going to keep them out of your yard, but that's a deterrent. And just like with burglars breaking into your house, you're never going to make your house immune to burglars. If someone is determined to get into your house, they'll probably do it. But burglars aren't like that. They just want a target of opportunity. So if you make your house inaccessible to them, they'll go down the house, uh, down the street to the neighbor who left their garage door open, and that's who they're going to hit, right? Well, mosquitoes are the same way. You know, if your yard doesn't have water sources, uh, stagnant water sources in your yard, and it has a lot of plants in it that they don't like the smell of, but your neighbor's yard doesn't look like that, they're going to go over to your neighbor's yard instead. Pretty simple. You know, it's nothing's cosmic about this. So it's doing things that can deter the mosquitoes from coming into your area. Um, citronella is really good. Citronella torches, uh, candles, that works well. Catnip oil, if you can get that is even more effective than citronella. Um, and uh, if you don't like using sprays on your body that you have DEET in it, lemon eucalyptus uh, oil has been shown to be just as effective at certain concentrations as DEET is. Even more effective than, than some of the uh, DEET products that are on the market. So you can go with something like that and stay more natural. Um, they also sell dunks that you can also get from York County Mosquito Control that you can put in water. Say you have a bird bath or you have a pond that the water doesn't move that much in there. You can get dunks to put in there. And those dunks have a bacteria in it called Bacillus thuringiensis israelianus. And 
that is a subspecies of a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis that specifically feeds on the larva of mosquitoes. It's not harmful for uh, fish, it's not harmful for humans or mammals or anything else in nature except for mosquito larvae. And it will it'll consume them all day long. So you put one of those dunks in your in your pond that doesn't have a lot of water movement in it, and that is no longer a home for mosquitoes. And put in a couple goldfish in there too. You know, mos uh, goldfish will, will eat mosquito larvae. So little things like this, really simple things, can keep you from spending hundreds of dollars on an ineffective treatment for your yard against mosquitoes. And you have to keep spending those hundreds of dollars to keep that treatment going. And it's not really effective and it's killing off everything else out of your yard. When I used to have my yard sprayed for mosquitoes, I never saw fireflies anymore. Never. They were gone. A lot of the butterflies were gone too. Now I have them all over the place. So I've thrown out a lot of information and, and, and I've been talking for, for quite a long time and, and I'm going to give myself laryngitis here, but th there's a lot to take in and we'll be posting this um, on, the, uh, on the web. So if you'd like, you can go back over and listen to parts of this again. But I'm not encouraging you to go whole hog on this. Myself, what I found that works pretty well for me is every year I try one or two new things. I'll try one or two new pollinator plants. I'll try one or two new vegetables in my garden. Maybe I'll try a new technique and see how that works for me that year. So maybe take a look at that list of host plants and figure out the one or two that you want to be planting in your yard this year. Maybe you just want to keep it simple and plant a couple extra plants of parsley this year. <laughs> and then watch the eastern black swallowtail caterpillars munch on it. That's great. It'll grow more. Don't worry if they completely denude it. That it'll, it'll grow uh, more back. Pick one or two new pollen or nectar sources that you can plant out there. Try Agastasia or Catnip or any of the other ones that you like the, the color of it. Please, please, please eliminate or reduce the, your use of pesticides. Um, there are better ways through integrated pest management that you can control your insects in your yard and it will be far less damaging to uh, what is in your yard. If you want to read more about this stuff, there are a whole bunch of resources that I have here for you. I'm going to leave this up here for a second because if you take your phone and hold it up to your computer screen, any of these QR codes will take you to those resources that are right by it. And if this is too quick, do a screen capture, uh, which is normally control and print screen on your uh, on your computer. That will capture this. I'll do a screen capture, and then you'll be able to take this and save it as a uh, as a graphic, and you can come back to this later. Uh, but there are a lot of resources on the Virginia Tech website uh, that I'd encourage you to use. <coughs> That's evidence based, scientific based information. Uh, that are facts as opposed to some things that are available on the web that aren't necessarily fa uh, facts. Pollinator.org is a fantastic website uh, and they have a very good and comprehensive guide to the outer coastal uh, region of the mid-Atlantic that's really good. But if I had to uh, plug any one thing on here, okay, I'm gonna plug two things on here because there's a lot of good things on here. Um, it is the third main bullet or the, the plant virginianatives.org. And it also happens to be in the bottom right corner of your screen, the native plants for Southeastern Virginia, including the Hampton Roads area. Uh, that is my go-to book when I'm taking a look at making decisions on what I wanna put in my yard, uh, what, the right, uh, what the right plant for the right area is. It is a fantastic resource and it's available in a PDF form for free on the web. You can also get a hard copy of it. I'd encourage you to do that. And if you need to get a hard copy of it, I can hook you up with that for five bucks. Uh, just need to get in touch with me uh, later, um, but uh, because it's well worth it. But take a look at the free version online first beforehand and make sure it's something that you want. And then, um, uh, of course, Xerxes.org is a uh, is a uh, fantastic website as well. Any of the books that you see uh, pictured here on the right hand side of your screen, there are two by Doug Tallamy, fantastic books. 
Uh, there's the uh, Xerxes Society uh, 100 Best Plants to Feed the Pollinators. That's another good one, although that focuses mostly on pollen and nectar uh, sources and not on the host plants. And if there's one, nothing that you take away from this is don't forget about the host plants. Those are really important to having pollinators in your yard. And so if you do all of that, and if, you, uh, if you're able to do that, you'll start seeing uh, things like this in your yard. And all of these are pictures I either took in my yard or in about 100 meters from my yard um, that are all over the place. I get tons of pollinators in my yard all the time. And these are just a couple of the photos that I have uh, that I take all the time. Um, it's really nice having them around here and it doesn't take a whole lot, some very simple steps. So with that, I'd like to uh, stop talking and give you guys an, an opportunity to ask uh, questions. I think that the way that we've done this in the past that works well, uh, I think we have Susan on, on board. And uh, if you could put your uh, question into the chat and then she'll put it out there so we don't have everyone trying to talk on top of each other. Um, and so let me go back to uh, let me go back to this and leave this up while Susan, uh, if you don't mind teeing that up. Yep. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of questions today, but we do have one so far. Um, she is uh, Jane is researching mulch options for her veggie garden. Um, I've read some benefits of cedar mulch as an insect deterrent, will it deter pollinators as well? No, it won't. Cedar mulch is great. Uh, cedar mulch will deter a lot of things that, uh, a lot of non-beneficial insects out of your, it'll, it'll deter some beneficial ones, but uh, I have, um, I've not seen any um, negative impacts of using cedar mulch, and I have used it in my yard in the past uh, around uh, pollinator plants. They, they don't seem to mind it. Hi, the um, the dunks that you were talking about are those safe for bird baths as well? Yes. Uh, so you mainly you mainly talked about ponds. I just wanted to make sure before I went and made bought one for my bird bath. <laughs> yep, they're 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 fantastic. They work in any water source. Uh, our previous homeowner left us a beautiful garden to upkeep and left us a bird bath and all kinds of good stuff that we're in bird feeders galore. So we are carrying on with her spirit. And I'm a little, I'm in a little over my head. <laughs> Nate, are those the same dunks that are available for free um, that the mosquito control gives the library? Yes, those are yes. exactly the same ones. So the, uh, I know, I know that they took a break from that in, in the uh, past year with COVID and everything. I don't know if you guys have those yet, but um, but those yes. are exactly. We do actually still have them. You can stop by the reference deck, desk at either the Tab or Yorktown libraries and just stop by um, and ask for mosquito dunks and we'll be able to give those to you. Yeah. So, I mean, the cost isn't even a, a, an issue there. It's, uh, it's just please, please, please stay away from the pyrethroids and the um, mosquito joes. And I didn't say that name, but uh, you know, that. They, that's not going to help you, your pain to make your problem worse. Yeah. And um, also, uh, your county will come out to your house and evaluate your yard and let you know where you might have some problem spots and even give you some tips on, you know, uh, what you can do as well. So um, the, that, that, the mosquito control will come out for free and evaluate your yard if you live in York County. Yeah, uh, so Betsy and Janice at Mosquito Control are fantastic. They're not the only two. I think there's uh, one or two other people there, but they're fantastic. Their direct number is 890-3790. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, if uh, if you'd like them to come out, they, they would far rather see an ounce of prevention than have to provide a pound of cure. So... Um, so please involve them in that if you have any questions. And I would say, um, and I put that number in the chat too, just in case he said it too fast, um, but they will come out, even if you're working, you can just say, hey, will you just come and check? 
um, or um, I did it one time because I have I have a ditch, and so I wanted them to give me some feedback about that. So they are happy to do that, even if you're at work. Um, and they will also drop off um, dunks and other granular things that they have for mosquito prevention as well. And um, I don't know if I got on a little bit late, so I don't know if Nate said anything about our plant sale. No, um, okay, we have, um, we have a plant sale um, May 1st from 8.30, I think, to noon. I have it somewhere. Um, I'm pretty sure it's 8.30 to noon. Um, and one of the ways that I have- Yeah, I literally have the flyer on my desk right now, and it is, okay. it's, eight, it's 8 to, to noon. Oh, okay, 8 to noon, great. So if you want a Yorktown onion, I would recommend getting there at 8 or 6.45. <laughs> Um, but other than that, we should have, um, you know, great supply of things. One of the ways that um, I have solved some of my, um, my mosquito issues um, is by planting um, plants in the ditch that like wet feet. So um, like, for example, ginger lily um, likes wet feet and so do iris and all kinds of other things. So I, I just keep looking for those kind of things and then planting those in my, in my ditch. So um, that seems to be helping. Now, I don't, this is not a, a York County sewer or runoff, you know, near the street. This is just a ditch, like a runoff um, from my yard. So I wouldn't say put plant things in, you know, something else like that. Um, I was going to say something else. Oh, so somebody said something about thanks for the information. Last year, the butterflies ate all of our parsley. Now we know why. I will say I don't like parsley and I plant a ton of it every year because of those um, swallowtail caterpillars and they're just so fun to watch. So um, I literally, that's the only reason I have parsley in my yard. Yeah, I, I, I plant a dozen each year. And the nice thing is if you keep them planted and uh, the second year, if you can keep them alive, you can harvest the seeds from it and then you have free seeds. Is it better to plant plants like the coneflower plants, buy them and plant them or do them from seed? Well, I, everything in my garden, pretty much all, all of my vegetables and flowers and annuals I grow from seed. Uh, because I enjoy doing that. It all depends on you. You know, if you have the uh, wherewithal and the time to care for the seeds. Um, and right now you can probably sow them directly into the ground. Soil temperatures are above 50 degrees right now. Uh, we've had a rapid warm up uh, this spring. So you could go ahead and plant those cone flowers right now into the ground and, uh, and grow them from seed. And you will get a much wider variety of flowers um, then, um, then you can get just buying the plants at the big box stores or even at the nurseries, uh, you can just get a much better variety from seeds okay. to, to suit your individual purposes. Thank you to everyone for coming and learning a little bit more about this. Um, it's, it's really a lot of fun once you can get your yard really popping with the pollinators and seeing them all over the place. It's, it, it's fantastic and it doesn't take a whole lot of work. It just takes a little bit of understanding.